Trinitas, I know it's not news to anyone that on October 7th, Hamas attacked and killed some 1,000 Israel, Israeli civilians and 300 military and police. They also took 242 hostages. As depressing as that is, it's maybe doubly depressing to learn that the passage that we're about to read is about military conflict in literally exactly the same region of the world. 3,000 years ago, in the time of David, what we have are military conflicts between Israel and Philistia, the very region where we see these distressing events in our day. Um, how many of you feel like you've got a solid handle on why there's a conflict between Israel and Palestine? Like, you're like if you had a multiple choice quiz, well, that might even be too easy. If you had a, a, a written answer quiz, you could go, I could explain why there's fighting in this region. I suspect that the answer for most of us, if we're honest, is we could maybe jot down a few things, but we have really pretty close to no clue. Um, we don't know when it began, maybe. <laughs> And maybe it began in 3,000 uh, 3, years ago. We don't exactly know what could end it or what a good solution would be. Um, this is because war is worse than any of us think. It's way worse. And the confusion that is inherent to it is part of the judgment involved in it. We're going to read a passage about three overlapping wars in just 12 verses. And frankly, it's confusing too. I'll bet if you were doing your daily Bible reading, you'd read all the words, but maybe not have a ton of comprehension. We're going to try to learn from this passage today. Let's bow our heads and ask the living God to work in us and to help us. Mighty God, we confess you to be the Trinity, and right now we need the third person of the Trinity, the one who has committed from eternity past to dwelling within us sanctifying us, illuminating our minds, pointing us back to Jesus Christ, our Savior, second person of the Trinity. We know we need him because our own mental efforts are not sufficiently strong, and in fact, our inclination to confusion and sin is evident in this world that is war-torn. We're cut from the same cloth as every people on planet Earth that is warring right now. And we need, we need to transcend our sinfulness, and we need your help. And we ask, therefore, in Jesus' name, to send your spirit. Amen. If you'll open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 27, we're going to read the whole thing. When I'm done, I'll say this is God's word, and you can rise to your feet and say thanks be to God, and we'll sing the glory of pottery together. 1 Samuel chapter 27. Then David said to himself, now I will perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than to escape into the land of the Philistines. Saul then will despair of searching for me any more in all the territory of Israel, and I will escape from his hand. So David arose and crossed over he and the 600 men who were with him to Achish, the son of Maach, the king of Gath. And David lived with Achish at Gath, he and his men, each with his household, even David with his two wives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the Carmelitess, Nabal's widow. Now, it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, so he no longer searched for him. Then David said to Achish, if now I have found favor in your sight, let them give me a place in one of the cities in the country that I may live there. For why should your servant live in the royal city with you? So Achish gave him Ziklag that day. Therefore, Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. The number of days that David lived in the country of the Philistines was a year and four months. Now, David and his men went up and raided the Geshurites and the Gerizites and the Amalekites, for they were the inhabitants of the land from ancient times, as you come to Shur, even as far as the land of Egypt. David attacked the land and did not leave a man or a woman alive, and he took away the sheep, the cattle, the donkeys, the camels, and the clothing. Then he returned and came to Achish. Now Achish said, where have you made a raid today? And David said, against the, the Negev of Judah, against the Negev of the uh, Jeremelites, and against the Negev of the Kenites. David did not leave a man or a woman alive to bring to Gath, saying, otherwise 
they will tell about us saying, so has David done, and so has been his practice all the time he has lived in the country of the Philistines. So Achish believed David, and saying, he has surely made himself odious among his people Israel. Therefore, he will become my servant forever. This is God's word. All right, Trinity Toss, I'm going to briefly, after I excuse the kids, to go participate in the kids' catechism class, uh, head up front with, uh, looks like, Abraham and uh, Michael Rath. Um, I'm going to briefly summarize our passage um, before we go into learning five lessons from it. If you didn't notice or you didn't put it together, the passage we just read alludes to or tells you about three overlapping wars. David flees into the land of Israel's enemies because he's in a civil war with the king of Israel, Saul. If you haven't been asleep for the last several months, you'd know that David has been a fugitive before King Saul, who is also his father-in-law. He's had to evade death by having a spear tossed at him by the king, after which he became a fugitive and eventually began hiding in caves, and he's now amassed a force of 600 men. David gets the idea, even though Saul has repented twice of trying to kill David, that I've just got to get out of this land somewhere safe. And strategically, he thinks, the safest place I can go is into the land of Israel's enemies. This alludes to the second war going on. It's an international war between Israel and Philistia. The Philistines had five major cities, Ashdod, Gaza, Ashkelon, Gath, and Ekron. Philistines boasted men like Goliath, whom David was uh, the one who slayed, and David ended up with Goliath's sword. Now, Kish, the king of Gath, originally when David, five chapters ago, tried to go into Philistia for hiding, didn't allow him to stay. But in our passage, he does. This is because David has proven his salt, you might say, as an enemy of Saul's. He looks like the head of a good mercenary force. And the picture that you're actually reading about is David entering into a relationship like that of a servant, a mercenary to a quiche, willing to fight under his banner. Now, the stay is uncomfortable. It only lasts for one year and four months. And in fact, David and his men have to go live in their own city, Ziklag. In the ancient world, there was no vision of multiculturalism. There was no sense that maybe your tribal people can live in the same place as our tribal people It's just not going to work. And you see the same thing today in prison populations. Prison populations where everybody's agitated, everybody is criminal, and everybody is potentially at war. Well, lines get drawn very quickly, and they're not multicultural lines. This is how a world that was run by tribal chieftains worked. The third war you read about in this passage is a holy war. David and his men, while they live in Philistia, go back into the south land of Judah, and they kill some of the historic enemies of Israel. Uh, we'll talk more about these in a moment, but it convince, convinces Achish that David is on his side, because David just says, I'm going into the south country of Judah to kill people. He doesn't tell him, I'm going there to kill Israel's enemies as opposed to Israelites. So Achish says at the end of the passage, he has surely made himself odious among his people, Israel. Therefore, he will become my servant forever. If you're reading this passage, you would be thinking, who in the world are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? And the short answer is there is no simple answer. This leads to our first lesson that war, and this might seem obvious, but it's not so obvious as you think, war is confusing. And it will be until the end. In some ways, the king of Philistia is an ally to David and at this moment, kind of a good guy. In some ways, Israel as a nation is a bad guy, but David's an Israelite and he's part of them. It's confusing. See, the problem with us as a human race is we want war to not be confusing. We want it to be more like a sporting event. We want there to be team A, team B. We want them to wear different colors, preferably contrasting ones, black and white, red and blue. We want it to be obvious that one team's going left, the other team's going right. And we want the objectives to be clear with a clear beginning of the war, a clear ending of the war. But that's not the way any war actually is. 
this last football season, I saw several coaches say things like, hey, kids, we're going to battle. I feel like telling the coach, coach, if we were going to battle, the first person to die would be the referee. It's, <laughs> this is nothing like a battle. It's nothing like a battle at all. Man, if, if this was at all like a battle, it would be more like a stadium rushing the field in hand-to-hand combat, and it wouldn't be fun. Before the service today, I was talking to multiple people here. Believe it or not, this Saturday, in the game after my boys and the Hedgecock boys played a little league football game, the next game came up that my boy Augie would have been in the game and Scott's boy Knox would have been in the game. This game was between Eastside Catholic and Burien and an altercation broke out between two dads. They were expelled from the stadium and one of them shot the other individual in the parking lot at Everett Memorial Stadium. That didn't further the game. All the games ended yesterday because of this. That's what happened at a football game. And it's so confusing, so distressing, that any fun that was going to happen that day ended. War, physical violence are nothing like sporting events with clear rules, obvious ends, and obvious goals. And here's the thing. This is true even of the wars that you look back on and think of as simple. If you were to think of an American war that strikes you as kind of a simple conflict, obvious good guys, obvious bad boys, the one that is most recent in your memory would surely be World War II, right? Most people don't find it objectionable to stop Nazi domination of Europe or Japanese domination of the Pacific. Most people think those were good objectives, and I agree. But still, the tendency to think the Allies were good guys is not that simple. How many of you guys think of the Allies as the good guys? Now, you are aware, though, that the Allies had one ally named Joseph Stalin, who killed at least 30 million of his own people, guilty for the Ukrainian starvation of some 5 million people. He was on our side. See, this is complicated, you guys. War is always complicated. And many of you know that when the war ended with Germany, Churchill wanted to go on and fight our own allies, the Soviets. But it didn't happen. What about the bad guys? Who were the bad guys in World War II? The Axis, right? Okay, but before you answer that as a simple, straight answer, how many of you know what side of the war Finland fought on? Anybody know? Nice try. In fact, Finland, from 1941 to 1944, was part of the Axis. This isn't because they were excited about Hitler taking over everything. It's because before World War II started, as our history books mark it, they were already at war with Russia, who happened to be one of the allies, because Russia was an expansionist nation trying to take over their territory. So they engaged in coordinated attacks against the Russians with the Nazis. But in 1944, at the end of the, at the, end of the war, they turned on the Nazis as well. So we'll give them credit for that. But... It's just incredibly complicated. Complicated to make your eyes glaze over if you'd been in the world at that time, the same way that this Israel-Gaza conflict does today. Sometimes it's painted as a war of Judaism versus Islam. That, That can't be the explanation, seeing as over half of Israel claims to be non-religious. And just the same, the Palestinians have nothing like friendly relations with other Islamic nations. That's why Egypt won't allow refugees to flee into their country. They're actually afraid of the Palestinians because their country had recently seen a radical Muslim coup almost take over the government. It's just complicated. And this leads us to our next observation. Not only is every war complicated and just worse than you think because of that. Second observation is that despite our best efforts, war cannot be avoided. How many of us, when we hear about this conflict in in Palestine, just want to forget about it and move on? Like you can't handle it. It's too complicated. You're not going to read a headline about it. It's just too much. And I want to tell you, there's something right about that. 
The, the right aspect of that is you want to stay out of conflict wherever possible. But what's wrong with that is we will never be able to stay out of conflict entirely. Pacifism is actually not a biblical ideal in the absolute sense. I'm going to first talk about the right inclination there. Um, Yes, we should avoid wars at all costs. How many people know George Washington's farewell address, what he had to say about international entanglements? He poses this question, why by interweaving our destiny with that of any part of Europe, entangle our peace and prosperity in the toils of European ambition, rivalship, interest, humor, or caprice? Why mess around? I want you to know David had this mentality too. The first time David fled into Philistia, he wrote Psalm 34, one line of which says, seek peace and pursue it. We should seek peace at all costs. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. This is what the Bible says. And honestly, one of the reasons we seek peace, brothers and sisters, is because we know the biblical promises that there will be a day on planet Earth when the nations, by and large, will beat their hammers, excuse me, hammer their swords into plowshares. We look forward to a season of peace. But here's the thing. War often comes to us in a way that it cannot be avoided. David was born into an Israel that had been taunted, raided, and occupied by a Philistine giant. He couldn't pretend it wasn't happening. David was adopted into Saul's house as his armor bearer, then his son-in-law. and He became the recipient of, of Saul's hostilities without without seeking it. And it wouldn't have been at all godly for David to simply withdraw from the, the, the conflict altogether. The story of David is not that David became a hermit who sang psalms by himself on mountaintops. It's not the story of Siddhartha Buddha who withdrew from our illusory world via pure meditation. To do have done so would have been to surrender his family, his nation, and their mission to death. This is why in the New Testament, numerous Roman soldiers become Christians and they don't have to quit their job. The Bible is incredibly realistic about the fact of human conflict. And guys, war will be imposing on you, if not you, your children, but very likely within your lifetime as we don't tend to go very long without it. If you'd been in the United States in the Civil War, you either lived in a northern state or a southern one. You might have found yourself in a town for there was a battle in the fields that surrounded you. There's nothing you could do. Same is true when you're attacked as we were in World War II. You have no option but to take a position. And you know what? Even right now, indirectly, our nation has to be involved in different wars. Let me give you an example of what I mean. When you pick up a map of the world as printed in America, Israel will be on that map. That means we've already taken a position that over 20 other countries in the world do not take, namely that Israel is even a country. The same is not the case in Iraq. The same is not the case in Egypt. The same is not the case in North Korea. One headline was that China, over last week, erased Israel from all of its official maps online. If you look on a map online, Israel doesn't exist. You can't avoid it. And frankly, friends, you also can't avoid condemning certain moral acts even without being militarily involved in a war. As complicated as all things are, Gaza-Israel conflict, I'm sorry, there is no ground whatsoever for anything less than total outright condemnation of the October 7th Hamas attack on Israel. It was unjustifiable on any level, period. It targeted civilians. There is no just war theory under the sun which validates targeting civilians. It's just not, you, you can't do it. It was calculated to breed more war. It was not waged by a sovereign government who had declared war. And it involved taking civilian hostages who could be tortured and used as collateral for further military engagement. We have to be able to say that was unjustifiable on every level. The only way it could be justified is if God himself had commanded them to do that. And we'll have more to say about that topic. This doesn't mean that Israel has a blank check to go into uh, Gaza and do whatever they want. 
But I will tell you, the moral questions involved there are qualitatively different than whether or not you can descend from the sky and just kill civilians. They're just qualitatively different. War cannot be avoided very often, but the third thing we have to consider, and this is the least controversial thing I'm gonna say all day today, from any perspective you hold, any worldview you hold, War is fundamentally what we deserve as sinners before a holy God. We deserve it as a human race, pure and simple. There's no way around it. Some of us want to check out from the reality of war because we have this illusion that we fundamentally deserve something better, that war is for especially messed up peoples, and I don't deserve the headache of having to look it square in the face. But the problem is, is that this madness before us, this confusion, this bloodshed, this war is fundamentally what we deserve as a human race to be confused by it, to be fearful of it, enveloped in it. And I wonder if you could say, you could look yourself in the mirror and actually say, I deserve the deepest hostilities of my fellow man, my government, and the governments of the world. I'm just going to carry on about this thesis for a moment that we deserve war. Let's look at it empirically. First of all, it's a constant feature of human existence. At all times, bloody conflict has been going on somewhere. Sometimes bloody conflicts have been going on everywhere. And the disposition toward it is present in all of us. Take physical aggression. Violence manifested in children from the earliest ages. I distinctly remember punching my big brother right in the stomach when I was about six. I didn't need anyone to teach me that. Rivalry, heartlessness, greed, cruelty, outbursts of anger. They're with all of us. When you consider this even further, we, we create conflicts between others. We're guilty of doing that, each one of us. And it's in this passage, even with who you might like to think of as the hero. Passage tells us David has two wives, just tells us in passing. Leviticus 18.18 18 condemns, you shall not marry a woman in addition to her sister, familial or national, as a rival. The fruit of having two wives is rivalry. The book of 1 Samuel opened that way with a guy guy named Elkanah who had two wives, Peninnah and Hannah, and it was nasty. In fact, as it turns out, the Israeli-Arab conflict that we're looking at is the fruit of two sister wives, Abraham's wife, Sarah, and her maid, Hagar who birthed two sons, Isaac and Ishmael, and today Israel is a descendant of Isaac, and the Arab nations understand themselves to be descendants of Ishmael. In this passage, we're we're looking at the sorts of behaviors from which deep rivalries lasting thousands of years begin. We create these conflicts. And there's no way around it. How how do you avoid the conclusion that we are fundamentally deserving of this as a human race? There have been ridiculous solutions. Some people say wars are only caused because of wealth disparity. Where did that come from? Evidently human greed. And then these people will say, no, it's just the top 1% of wealthy and their greed that causes wars. And this is at the heart of anti-Semitism. I just like to ask these people, so what's your solution? To go to war with those people. So war is your solution to war. And don't you realize if we wiped out the top percent, 1% of wealthiest people, there would just be a new 1% of wealthiest people. And it wouldn't end. I also question whether or not there are really no simply heartless middle-class people responsible for acts of violence. It's obvious that there are. You know what other people will say? Religion. Ah, that's the source of wars. Our religious fantasies, it will be said, are the source of wars. Look, the God of the Bible right here endorses genocide in our passage. He's just as bad as Allah sanctioning jihad. They'll say that. Can anyone unravel how ridiculous an answer this is to where wars come from? If Yahweh and Allah are just human fantasies made by men, 
then once again, the people responsible for creating wars are men. And once again, war is exactly what we deserve. It's no solution. There's no secular solution, no one to be mad at for human wars but ourselves. Just, I wonder if you really believe, Trinitas Church, that we are sick beyond healing by any devices of our own, that what we're witnessing today in Gaza, what we're witnessing in our passage with David and Philistia is but an outward expression of our inward condition, that our hearts are an open grave as the Apostle Paul says. And part of the authenticity of the Bible is that God neither hides human conflict nor our conflicted nature from us in his word. He rips back the curtain and requires that we look at it straight in the eye. The Bible tells us why there are wars. It's not surprising. You might imagine it's human envy. It says in James 4, 1 through 2, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Most of you could have probably gathered there's war in Israel right now because, well, two peoples want something, at the heart of which is land, resources, power, and their way of life to exist. And these things are not bad in themselves. Real quick, mental exercise. Paint a picture of yourself. Nowhere. That's a tough one because you're dead when you do that. Any picture of yourself that you have is somewhere, and therefore it's appropriate for people to desire land and places to live. Here's the thing, though. There is no accumulation of anything that will stop you from envying and wanting because the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3.11, God has put eternity in your heart. You want eternity because you were made for relationship and fellowship with an eternal God. And if you go looking for eternity in this world, friends, you will be involved in constant conflict. Envy is not the only source of sin. Honestly, our guilt is. When you're guilty and evil, the most powerful solace comes from preoccupation with other people's evil. It's the truth. The best way to deflect your own sense of guilt in a worldly way is to be preoccupied with others. Adam in the garden shifted blame to his wife, focused on her evil. And all mankind, nations, and peoples have been doing it ever since. Have you had any inclination to look down on Israel or Palestine or both and said to your heart, those backward, bloodthirsty, greedy people, they're hopeless? That right there is a bit of self-righteous guilt deflection. (laughs) Supposing that if you lived in either of those places, You wouldn't be involved in the same conflicts to the same degree. This leads us to our fourth observation. We've had several. Our first one was that war is inherently confusing. Second one is that war cannot be avoided. We just saw a moment ago that war is what we deserve. And this leads to our fourth observation that there is no gospel without war. There can't be. It's our big problem. How can the good news do anything but answer to that And this allows us to reflect briefly on God's holy war policy. If we fundamentally deserve war, no one can accuse God if he decides to wipe off the face of the earth, any people or individual. It's what we deserve. And God does that with a select set of nations, eight nations, eight rather tribal peoples, of which the Amalekites are one. God charged Israel to totally annihilate these eight peoples, only these eight peoples, and we got to talk about why. The Bible gives us two reasons for why. They were to show no favor to them, according to Deuteronomy 7.1, for they will turn your sons away from following me. It was for protection. The rationale goes like this. The Savior Jesus was to be born from Israel. And if that nation of Israel were lost into paganism, there would be no family to raise Jesus, no stage for redemption, and frankly, no salvation. That is what merited in this lone set of cases such a harsh war policy to annihilate peoples. The gospel had to be protected. And the people who would bring it forth 
had to be protected from bad influences. It is nothing like the Islamic war policy, which makes it part of a program of worldwide domination. It's nothing like that. And the second reason why this was required is because these people were the distinct hostile enemies of the gospel itself. See, the gospel was to be proclaimed in Israel in its sacrificial system, in all of its rights, almost as a drama anticipating the coming of Christ. And those peoples who opposed it to its face were to be made part of that drama to realize that if you oppose Jesus Christ himself, the gospel itself, there is no mercy to be had for you. You will die without it. The gospel comes into this world with the recognition that sin merits warring self-destruction, and that's exactly what Jesus suffers. It is not coincidence that Jesus dies at the hands of two warring nations, like two warring beasts, a beast from the land of Israel and a beast from the sea of nations, the Romans and the Israelites. It's not coincidence that he's put on a cross with soldiers jeering him and priests condemning him, holy warriors and civil warriors. In fact, Jesus stands under the furious wrath of the Father himself, the sword of wrath that was allotted to the Amalekites and these condemned peoples, and he cries out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus Christ stands in our place. And yet at the same time, this man never of himself added to human rebellion, never added to this warring hostility and said he suffered it on behalf of all those who believe in him. I would simply set before you today, if you have never believed in Jesus, there's an ultimatum that sits before you. You can either surrender to Jesus Christ, receive him as your savior and substitute, have eternal life right now that does not end, or you can be surrendered to the horrors of human rebellion and all those things on the TV that you click off because it's so stomach-turning to see. It's the closest thing to a picture of the punishment that we deserve and that we will suffer apart from our Savior. If you were to ask the question, why are Christians today no longer committed to annihilating other peoples? Well, first off, We couldn't identify an Amalekite if we tried, and that was one of the only peoples for whom this policy was allowed. But we also don't have a sacrificial system anymore for shadowing Christ by sacrificial drama. And we're also not an infant people waiting to birth the Christ. Instead, the severity of divine justice is never more clear than in the proclamation of the gospel that God did not spare his own son poured out his wrath on his own son that we might be redeemed, that the nations might know that there is a a never-ending wrath that awaits those who don't believe. See, we don't need that system anymore. And moreover, God the Holy Spirit enables us to influence the sinful nations more powerfully than they influence us. That's why he sends us out. We're not kids to be protected in a small backyard anymore. We've been sent out to evangelize the nations Some people might say, Brent, well, how do we know that Islam's holy wars aren't actually commended to them by the true and living God? Well, I'll give you just a handful of reasons. First of all, the Quran claims to be the continuation of the Bible message. And the Bible message clearly declares in the New Testament that our battle is not with flesh and blood, that the weapons with which we wage war are not swords, that what they are now is the word of God and our sanctification and the spirit. And there's no way to build on that Bible like the Quran claims to. It's going backwards. It's condemned by its own claims. It's the contradiction of a false God. 
Just the same, the Quran undermines divine justice. They aren't proclaiming by their holy wars that there is this God who has an absolute justice that he upholds. Instead, their God is admittedly arbitrary. He forgoes justice for some who get saved and he's merciless to others. There's no atonement by Jesus Christ that accounts for your salvation. No divinity of Jesus Christ. Most of all, the Quran deviates from the Bible in having no doctrine of the Holy Spirit to empower us to holiness, love, and self-control. I'm gonna tell you something. The God of Islam is not just false, not just an aberration from the biblical trinity. The God of Islam is Satan himself, and Muslim nations are enslaved. God help us if we don't pray for them. Our fifth observation is that we must never allow human conflicts to distract us from our holy war. If you were David, do you think you could maybe say to yourself, when you're fleeing from a hostile king in a civil war into an enemy nation with other hostile peoples, do you think you could have said to yourself, you know what? These circumstances excuse me from waging any sort of holy war commended to me in the Bible. I... I'm tapped out. David could easily have said, navigating my relationship with Philistia and then with Saul, all too complicated for me to be, for me to be burdened with anything else. But here's the problem. God made it clear that he did want David to war with Amalek. And he didn't let the confusion of the world get him down. I want to talk to you about your holy war. The Bible is very clear Our battle is not with flesh and blood. Instead, it says, are you putting to death the sinful deeds of the body? Have you determined not to go on presenting the members of your body as instruments of sin and unrighteousness? Or do you excuse yourself? I'm too tired. Life is too difficult. I've been mistreated. Was David more faithful at taking up a sword to fight an enemy people in the midst of multiple battles? Was he more faithful at fighting that war of flesh and blood than you and I are at fighting a holy war against our flesh and on behalf of the holy God who redeemed us with his own blood? Let me ask you something. Is Hamas more faithful at fighting an unholy war on behalf of Satan than you and I are at fighting a holy war against our flesh and against Our sin, by the empowering agency of the Holy Spirit. What avenues of sin do you need to cut off right now? What avenues of human sin in your life do you need to take warring action against right now? Is it the suspicions about your neighbors in this room and how they haven't been good enough friends to you? Is it some electronic device that is a porthole to pornography that nobody else can check? Is it some substance in your life that you're using to check out? And I would ask you this this other question. Not only is your sanctification your war, but how is your prayer life? How many of you have been distressed about the state of the world and just gone on with your day and prayed very little? Or have you determined to intercede for the nations, to insert yourself in the middle of these conflicts by prayer? Ephesians 6, 13 and 18 says, therefore take up the full armor of God with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Are you glad that you don't have to pick up a war and go out annihilating peoples anymore? You don't have to pick up a sword? Are you really glad about that? Glad enough to say, I will gladly take up prayer as my instrument. Or do you just celebrate being delivered from the one by watching a whole lot of football on the Lord's day? 
I admonish you, brothers and sisters, we're gonna be praying tonight at the Kirk residence. You wanna come out and pray? You wanna lay your burdens at the feet of Christ? You wanna intercede for the nations and believe that the Almighty is gonna hear what you have to say? Join us. If you have seen a dearth of prayerful fighting in your life, join us. Because the war is worse than you think. It's not two nations of flesh and blood. It is a war being waged by spiritual powers and demons like those afflicting Muslim peoples in Gaza and secular peoples like Israel and America. And those powers are not expelled with swords. Our Lord Jesus said, some demons only come out with prayer and fasting. Let's bow our heads. Mighty God, it's impressed upon us that um, the conflicts of the world are worse than we think. They're not somebody else's, they're our own. They're not somewhere outside of us, they're within every single human soul. God, we pray that we would not be given to guilt deflection by preoccupation with others' evils, but that we would see ourselves in them and that we would give ourselves to the mightiest tools of warfare that you've given us, your word and prayer, righteousness, holiness, a Christian fellowship that is genuine and true, even worship on the Lord's day. Pray, God, that we would leave this place like salt of the earth, preservatives everywhere we go. Your spirit would go with us as well and that we would be conformed to the image of our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, by your Holy Spirit, amen.